we will snap our finger to the microphone in three, two, one. We shall become warlords of the eternal boundaries of hell in three, two, one. Gaffelder! On the shoulders of dwarves, a weekly podcast about role-playing games. Hello and welcome to On the Shoulders of Dwarves, a weekly podcast about role-playing games and the gamers who game them. My name is Ran Aviram. My name is Uri Lifshitz. Hey! Hello, my name is Dasi. Who are you, Dasi? Um, so I was told that just being Iran's wife is not a, enough of a qualification to be in this lovely podcast. Uh, so I will add to that that I'm also um, a lecturer in urban fantasy and a long time, 10 year at least, role player. And today we will be discussing a game that I've been playing with Dasi and only Dasi. One on one game. Yay! As someone who always preferred to max- maximize his gaming group, I, I pretty much, like in the last two decades, always played in a group of four players, one GM, and one open seat for visiting players, which randomly are randomly picked by the GM. I don't have much experience with one-on-one games, so I'm going to take the role of the skeptics and basically constantly ask you, but how? How? How is that possible? How? Throughout the episode. Now, I usually run games for three players. Dasi, Aviv, and Ev is my, I think, default group right now. And I think that this is an, an excellent number of players. I find it really easy to run for three players. It is not, however, at all similar to running for a single player. So it's not that the, the less you have, the closer it is to one-on-one. One-on-one is a different type of game, I think, completely from a regular game. And there are, I should note right now, several systems that exist that are designed specifically for one-on-one games. The reason we discuss this topic is, as I said, that Dasi and I started playing one-on-one really like a few days back. And this is thanks to Aviv and Ev that has started playing one-on-one as well. Uh, Ev also being first-time GM, running for his wife, Aviv. And that's excellent. That's lovely. Great news. Great news. They have some experience, now we have some experience, and as usual, we would love to hear some more experience from you guys at home, if you have anything to say after you listen to this episode, at show at dwarfcast.net. Let us now start by discussing the game. So, from the player's perspective, I mean, I suppose the one thing to keep in mind is that you're going to be alone in a very dangerous world. So... I would say, at least for me, it was very different because I tend to play with Aviv and Ev and we have our own dynamic. The dynamic is I do crazy shit and Aviv saves my life. And that's that's what we do. So, I mean, and we know that that's going to happen. So if we're on a pirate ship and I have a spell that will destroy everything, then I will cast a spell to destroy everything and everyone will try to kill me and I will almost die and Aviv will save my life. That's how it works. But here there's no, no Aviv. So you need to, I mean, if you, if you like me, my, my tendencies are to min max my character. So 20, um, 20 points in spellcraft, zero points in HP and vigor, for example. <laughs> it, it must be curtailed if you're in a one in one single player because my, my character would die in a, in a minute if, if I would play that for single player. So that's one thing to curtail. And the other thing to bear in mind is in order for a character to survive alone, it needs a little bit of everything. It needs to have a little bit of defense, a little bit of attack, communication skills, and stuff that it can do to help it survive in general. It can be being streetwise. It depends also on, of course, on the world that you're in. But look for the character that is not a support character, but the character that is a loner and can survive on its own. I want to intervene just a moment and say that while I've even ever playing classic D&D game with combats and dungeons and etc., etc., you and I are playing The Sprawl, which is a powered by the Apocalypse Cyberpunk game, which can't be any more different than D&D. And yet everything that we've just said is exactly the same. This concept is exactly the same in any one-on-one game, at least that we know of. So, yeah, I mean, 
managing expectations with your GM is always absolutely crucial, no matter how many players you have or what game you're playing. But it is equally so when you're one-on-one, because the game is yours. It is a personal game. In many ways, it's very flattering, because the GM's attention is only centered on you. Otherwise, you know, most games, some characters shine more in one session, others shine more in another session. It's about compromise a lot of the time. Here it's not. It's only about you. So it's very flattering and it's wonderful for ego. But you need to make absolutely sure that the, the character that you're playing fits the adventure that your GM planned out for you. So, for example, I am playing a hacker. Now, in order to play a hacker, I made absolutely sure that the adventure that Teran had in mind and the campaign that he had in mind is a campaign that's based around hacking and getting into the matrix and finding pay data and um, sabotaging all kinds of computer systems. Because otherwise it would have been ridiculous if the entire game would be about getting into the building and shooting everybody, then there would be no no point in playing the character that I chose. So that's really, but, really but crucial. How, how do you do something like that without basically just planning the entire campaign together because you're telling the GM, okay, I want A, B, and C. So that's pretty much, you pretty much decided your own gaming experience. Well, yes and no. It's something that, for example, the spall call flags. Any choice that you make is a flag that you signal to the GM, I am interested in a story that revolves around this. I create a contact who is this cocaine dealer in the slums, I want to have something happen to to them. And I want some relationship with them, etc., etc. It's not yet the whole story. It's just the topic that the story will revolve around. And it's in many ways the same in D&D. Like, for example, Aviv and Ev, Aviv is playing a cleric which is a very well-rounded character. It, it has excellent survival abilities. Um, it can do a lot of interesting spells. And she's playing specifically a character of a sign goddess. And she wants to, you know, check it out and see what, what happens when you're a cleric of a sun goddess. She doesn't know a lot about this sun goddess. And Ev is sort of allowing her to explore the world and show her more and more of what he wants to show all revolving the fact that she is a cleric of a sun goddess. So he won't be, for example, throwing her into a pirate scene. It has nothing to do with clericking or sun goddessing. She is in a quest to restore the sun goddess's shrine on some temple wherever, and anything that happens to her during the quest reflects automatically the choices that she made. Uh, another thing to add is the question of why you're playing a single player. There can be many reasons. First of all, if you're playing with your partner, it's, it's very easy, it's relatively very easy to organize a session, which is a great advantage. And there's a lot of fun in it. But one thing that you won't be able to do, which I really like to do, so you need to take that into account, is to help out other players. I love a situation wh- in which I enable another player to succeed really, really well. I gave them the plus two. I gave them a bonus to their weapon. I, I healed them at the right moment. I gave them inspiration. You can't do that in a one-on-one player, and that's something to bear in mind before you decide whether or not to get into that sort of dynamic. And that means it's an excellent opportunity to check out your other motivations. We discussed motivation, player motivations, a lot in episode 30. And if you listen to it, you might have noticed that helping others was not one of our 19 motivations that we've discussed. It might be a new one, actually. We, we had a short discussion about it in our forum on Facebook. So having a one-on-one is an excellent opportunity to try out new things and actually go quite crazy and way beyond what you usually do. Which is an excellent segue to the GM section of the episode. Hello, I am the GM. And the main thing I have to say is go crazy. (laughs) When you play one-on-one, there's really no need to care about the rules all that much. I mean, of course, you should, you should. I love rules. Everyone should love, yeah, rules are awesome. But the rules, unless you're playing a one-on-one game, the rules are meant for a group, for a party. And they mostly ignore everything we've just said. So care about the rules, but change them considerably. Mostly, I think, you should change the expectations of the rules. Like, for example, uh, D&D combat. Okay, very plain and simple. Have some orcs, push them against the the pieces. 
if you do it with a single PC, uh, they'll die. Because orcs, there are three orcs, there's one PC. That means that the orcs get at least 3d20 rolls every round, while the PC gets one. Uh, that's not fun for everyone involved. So all combats should either be against very simple, very weak creatures, or one, maybe two big, powerful creatures. Or you can make the PC overpowered. Huh. Make them two levels more than, you know, what they are supposed to be. I'm doing air quotes. Give them a plus five Holy Avenger sword. Make them way stronger than they usually are. This was very obvious to me when I ran the first session for Dasi because we didn't do this. So Dasi was alone against the world using a regular character, the, the same character that you would create for first game with a group of people, only there wasn't a group of people. So she had to face the world all alone and the world was ready for, you know, a group. <laughs> so I'm already aware that she will need to become tougher quicker than the system expects her to be. So does it, I'm going to double the amount of XP you gain, for example, probably. Why? Because it's important for the game to remain interesting and relevant for, for everyone involved. I don't want you to only, f I don't know, fight weak cyber orcs, I don't know, something from the future that is weak and not relevant. I want you to do interesting, cool things, but that means you need to be way more badass than you actually were on our first session. In D&D, you might want to give the character way higher ability scores than is recommended by the book. Because the usual array is nice, but it only allows you to excel in one thing. And we've just discussed before that a player character should excel in several things. Even if not excel, be capable in several things, at least. Otherwise, um, it will be annoying. Ev gave an interesting example. He told me how Aviv, who plays again a cleric, doesn't have proficiency in arcana. Which means, by the book... She's not all that good in knowing things about magic. If you are a strictler for the rules, she might not even be able to roll for specific things because you must have proficiency in order to roll. That means that huge parts of any regular adventure are simply out of the question for her. And that's not fun. That's not interesting. So you can do either of two things. Either you give her this ability which they decided not to do because they wanted to play a pretty plain cleric. And there was no reason story-wise for the story they two want, the two of them wanted to tell to give her a proficiency in arcana or not have that many arcana things in the game. Have more religion things in the game, for example. Just change the excuse from a wizard did it to a god did it. And then you can roll religion for it. <laughs> you know, basically speaking. So replanning the adventure, refocusing around a single character is, is vital, but I would claim that you should go further and tailor everything to the specific character. Which means not only you should fight a single orc, it should also probably even be a null instead of an orc, because nulls killed these characters, father and mother. And so she really hates nulls. So let's do it all about nulls. I mean, why should you even have something that is not part of the character's personalized story? This is where you can really go wild. I mean, they say that in role-playing games you can do whatever you do in movies and in stories, but I think they're wrong. You, you can't. I mean, when was the last time you managed to, for example, throw your party into jail? Or spend a, an hour or even two of the session on a date? I mean, one of the characters go out on a date or stuff like that. You can't, because generally speaking, these are personal things. Let's say that a character is visiting her parents. Now, we actually did have that in a group of three, um, interestingly enough. But I think it's an interesting example because Iran had to go out of his way for us to also find ways to interact with those parents of, of, the, of that particular character. It was Aviv's character's parents. And it was a lovely evening, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, but it, it, it really demanded a lot from Iran, because there needed to be various reasons why uh, the mother of Aviv's character was interested in my magic, for example. 
Whereas if there's only one character, you can have an entire session in which they go home, talk to their parents, c- catch up on what their baby brother has been doing. Fight their parents. Have a fight with the parents. Um, go back to your room. Whatever. I mean, you can have a lot of really personal relationships because there's only one person to do it with. The player. There's no need to have anything beside the personal, except for, of course, some trappings for the world to feel as if it is its own thing. Like, for example, if you only fight gnolls all the time, it's unrealistic, unless everything in the world is gnolls, and and then that's fine. The best way, I think, to make a game personalized is not only to sit with your player and make sure that the game is about the thing that they are interested in, uh, things that are relevant to their character, choices that they made with their characters and, and stuff is reflected in the game. That's, that's all important. But I think relationships are the thing that really make a game feel personalized. And that means you must have a lot of major NPCs. A lot. Because when people play in a group, they socialize with each other. The player characters talk with each other. Even if your game is really all about rolling dice and killing goblins, the player characters, better than that, the players still have someone to talk with each other. But when there's only you as the GM and the player, the player must have someone that they can direct their mouth at. And therefore, there should be a lot of people around. And I think it's important that all of these NPCs come from various social circles so that it won't feel as if everyone that you know is this middle class person from the streets. You must also know this childhood friend that was once with you during childhood, I assume. And there's this person that you help cross the streets because he was in the army and now he's missing a leg or whatever. And so you have people with different types of relationships from the get-go. I like this guy even though he's annoying as hell because we're from childhood. I pity this guy because he has... PTSD and he's missing a leg and there's this deep relationship between us and there's this guy that sells me my drugs and I really like him because I really like my drugs and that's useful as a GM because you can use all of these relationships in different ways and when you want to push the story in a specific way you can push a specific NPC out of all of this group and make things happen. One of the the big advantages of NPCs also on one-on-one player is is to emotionally involve the single player. Because, um, as I said, I for example, I really want to help out the other players. I really want to give Aviva plus two and Eva plus two and to make sure that the weapons are spick and span and that I, I really like characters who can heal, for example. I can't do that in one-on-one player. But what I can do is interact with other NPCs. And sometimes, actually, it's the conflict that's interesting. So, for example, to, in today's session, there was a really dis- sort of bullish guy by the name of Vance who really enjoyed pointing his gun at everybody. And so it, it was actually quite good, because I could play off of him as the sort of more moderate, um, reasonable person to say, put your gun away, we can solve this in a different way, which maybe I wouldn't have been able to do if he wasn't there, and I would just hide, and, and those people would just pass by, and there would be no conflict and no interest. So sometimes NPCs are helpful because they conflict with you, not necessarily because you like them. And this brings me to my last point. Mm-hmm which is about having an NPC with the player all the time. I think everything we've said so far is the simple truth, but having an NPC with the character is uh, debatable. For example, Ev doesn't feel comfortable as a GM to have an NPC around because he knows everything as a GM, and he doesn't feel comfortable separating himself from the... NPC, he, he's not sure he can do it, and he doesn't want to have a pawn running around and not actually doing a lot because he's afraid to make them do anything. However, the, there are so many useful qualities of having an NPC around. Like you've just said, it's someone to riff off. It's someone to contrast yourself against. It's someone that you can use as a GM simply by placing them. You can make them into a pillar of the story that the PC can now bounce around with. It's exactly what happened today. He did not at all, just so you guys know, at home, he didn't do anything to advance the story. There was a point, 
both of them needed to get there, he just moved toward it. And whenever he did it, he did it quite brutally. And thus he chose to do it less brutally. So, so she needed to fight him in ways to make sure that the, basically the mission doesn't go completely away and everyone knows we're here because he just runs forward. It didn't require almost anything out of me as a GM. And it did give Dasi a lot to do and to think about. And that was uh, really useful <laughs> because then that left me the time and energy to think about the mission itself and everything happening around. Another option and one that I would not recommend is having the NPC that only pops around to fight with you during combats because the system expects you to have more than one player and then disappears. Maybe if the player really likes combats and the GM as well, and you just want to have an interesting combat, and the player can then play two characters during combat to do all of these interesting tactical decisions, and then the second character evaporates. It can be quite interesting, by the way. Who are they and where do they go it's, to? It's interesting because I wanted to ask about how often would you say that the solution to the problem of having just one player is for one play for that player to play multiple characters? I would say never. It can be. It can be a solution. But I think that if you want to get the most out of one of one games, you should really focus on the tailoring to the character aspect. And that basically means that you should tailor it to a single protagonist. If you have two... I don't know. I don't think I would do that. I mean... In our game where we play um, uh, 50 Fathoms with Aviv and Ev, we each control the sort of minor character. And that's fine, because they're there so that if we're in different situations, we can help out. So, for example, if I'm off in the sea and they're doing something on land, then my minor character's with them, and then I can help them out. And I can participate in what they're doing. But if it's all about you, then I don't see... It, it seems like only a burden if you have to deal with another character that you don't really care about. So I wouldn't do that. I imagine a possibility where there's a GM and a player that both decided that they want to tell the story of these two guys. And the player creates two people. And they play the game. And he does, I, probably doesn't identify with any of them specifically but sort of with both of them, and they are both the main characters. That That's possible, I think. I personally don't think I would like to play that sort of a game, but maybe there are people in the whole world that would enjoy it. I would still call it a one-on-one -on -one game, because it's the GM and the player that's, that are important here. And I would still say that all of the things we discussed here are super relevant. Fair enough, actually. Yeah. Makes sense. There's one last thing I want to say as a GM, and it's an interesting reflection. When you play one-on-one, -on -one, there's a lot of silent moments. Because you as the GM go through some stuff, maybe you are looking for a rule, or maybe you are trying to figure out what is happening now. And usually, the players will talk among themselves when that happens. But there's only one player, and she is looking at you. <laughs> she is staring directly at you while you're doing this. This is a bit weird, um, but it's okay. It's also the other way around. While the player thinks about what to do, you as the GM are not turning to someone else and say, well, what you do, you just stare at her. And, and that was strange at first, but it actually just becomes a different sort of rhythm, and it's fine. It does mean that the session feels a bit slow-paced because... There's so much dead air, not a lot. I mean, most of the time you still talk, yeah? You, you, that, that's still a role-playing game. But there's a lot of dead air, more than you're used to, and that makes you feel as if everything takes a bit longer. It, it's just a weird observation. It's not anything, I think, that you should be worried about. No, it's interesting, because it's one of those things that I, I wouldn't think about until I would actually play, that the fact that there's only two people around the table means that whenever one of them is busy, it's, it's just you there alone. Unlike uh, a multiplayer game in which there's always someone who does something. 
One of the ways that I started to solve this, as Arad described at the beginning, it was a little bit awkward, is I started rereading my own rules when Iran was reading. So maybe that's what, something that you guys can, can decide on in advance. If, if the GM is, is planning out something, then the characters might as well reread their own rules. And, and since there's only one character, you better know them well and, and see and, and make sure that you know what everything's doing. It can't hurt to refresh yourself and it's less awkward than staring at the GM. I think that's basically it. Uh, Uri, any other questions? I am kind of torn, because on the one hand, that sounds awesome, and I would love to play a one-on-one -on -one game, but I can't even begin to think how to go about it, whether I don't even know if I want to be the player or the GM in that case. Interesting. I'm, I'm just going to have to do it and see what happens. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think it, it works probably very well with, with a partner, husband, wife, or... Whatever, whatever partner it may be, if, if that works out, or with a really good friend. I and mean, it works really well with someone that you have a lot of time with as is, and so it's very easy to sort of set a game and carve out time for that. One of the huge advantages is that we could just do that because we had a free afternoon together. And that's something that I think is, is one of the, the great sort of strengths of doing a one-on-one -on -one session. I also think it's interesting that we've managed to do it in a Powered by the Apocalypse game, and I've even have managed to do it with D&D &D 5. So apparently the system, of course the system matters, but it doesn't need to matter as much as one might think. You can possibly just take whatever system it is you are interested in, sit with your partner, and start playing it. Uh, it might be an interesting way to maybe test systems you don't get to play with uh, a group, Uri, for your consideration. Or best friend, or brother, or sibling, or any other close person that you have a lot of time with. Yes, 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 yes. Excellent. I think that's everything we have to say about the topic. I think so. I really enjoyed your game, Iran. Thank you very much. Thank, uh, thank you, Darcy, for <laughs> playing, for participating. And now we will be taking the load off. Woohoo! Uri, what, what are you loading off, the, the taking? Yesterday I was in a Pathfinder game and our GM got holed up and we started playing like an hour late, which means there's just basically... You know, four people sitting around the table and just chatting, shooting the breeze and talking regardless of the game. And I think it's one of those things which happen rarely because you usually meet to game, to play the game. And whenever you have like an extra hour of sitting down and just enjoying the moment with people, it kind of gets you into that understanding of Okay, I don't play with these guys just because they're good players. I play with these guys because I enjoy their company. And I think that's one of the things that I would miss most about a single-player game. The fact that you don't necessarily have that sense of camaraderie build because of the game, but extend beyond that. I just want to say that's an awesome feeling to have, to just sit around with a bunch of friends looking forward to something that's going to happen in a moment and have all that, you know, long and profound history together, which, you know, technically speaking, never happened, was imagined, but still have all the weight of an actual shared experience with you. And I find that's amazing. I'll even take it a step further. I, as a GM generally speaking, prefer to run to a big group if possible because I enjoy sharing the story with a lot of people. Now, the problem is I enjoy running for three people, not more than that, which is why I also really liked broadcasting, recording, and then broadcasting a lot of the things that we've played in the past. I, I want more people to be exposed to this thing this fiction we're creating because I invest a lot in it and I think it's awesome and it's important for me for people to see it. It's it's one of the reasons I'm doing anything creative that I'm doing. Of course, because creative art uh, it has a lot to do with the audience of that created piece of art. And in one-on-one, -on -one, you can't have that. Unless, of course, you for some reason record it from the side, but it's not something that we are currently at least doing. However, 
the advantages of this very personalized story that you can't really get otherwise are interesting enough that I am willing to continue this and, and keep going and see where, where, what's happening and how much fun, unique kind of fun, I can get out of it. Uh, it's a good thing you reminded me that we posted a, a post on our website talking about how to record your session. I just gave a brief overview of the different methods which I use to record my gaming session in the last four years or so. And I hope that will help you. And if you're not recording your sessions at the moment, maybe convince you to start doing so. Because it's a great, great souvenir from your role-playing game. So we'll give a link in the show notes. Or you can go to dwarfcast.net and click on the how Uri in the menu. My load of taking is the Annie's. I have been nominated to the Annie's for up to four players as the web best website. Which you are. Oh, thank you, Uri. The Annie's are a yearly award-winning ceremony in Gen Con by the Ian World, which is a huge gaming website. And it's been running for 18 years. And it's it's a combination of judges and votes. And being nominated is is quite an honor. Everyone can submit themselves. And I've submitted um, up to four players last year and again this year. And now we are indeed one of the five nominees. And that's awesome. And that's great and excellent. And let's hope it works. And when the voting begins, I let everyone know because I want them all to vote. Woohoo! However, I've also submitted on the shoulders of dwarves as best podcast, and we didn't get there, which is again fine. We only exist, what, half a year? Maybe a bit more. We only have 32 episodes, including this, so it's fine that we didn't get there. But next year... Next year! Yes, we will try again. I really hope we get it. We get it, because we, we have some great episodes, I think. I, I think, if you ask me. Yeah, you, if it was up to you, we would continue recording this podcast, you're saying. Yeah, I think so, and we'll win in any. That's it, I think. Dasi, any last one thing you have to say? Just to say congratulations on the Up to Four Players nomination for the Annie. That's amazing, and well done. Yay. If you want to hear more of this, or listen to us even longer, even more, even much listening, you can go to dwarfcast.net, you can go to Dwarf Podcast in Twitter or in Facebook, and you can walk out into the street and shout, Heron and Uri, do a podcast, and we will, next Monday, actually, that's how we usually do it. Yay, so, let's say goodbye to our listeners, traditionally by each of us saying farewell in, their, in our own, each in his own native tongue. Indeed. Later on! Later on! On the Shoulder of Dwarves is shared under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial form. The intro and outro are taken from Silly Fun by Kevin McLeod. Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution Free. Find us at dwarfcast.net and follow us on Twitter or Facebook.